So hi, welcome again. Um, we are now at session eight of our critical thinking and we will talk about arguments and validity in propositional logic. So the propositional logic is uh, just, you know, means logic with propositions. Uh, but uh, the question and, and all logic we do in this class is propositional logic. We don't do anything else. So the, um, the question is now what it means uh, for an argument to be valid. When is an argument valid and when it is not valid? And we already talked about that a little, right? We talked about validity when we um, uh, talked about conditional arguments that can be valid or invalid. We talked about um, validity when we talked about Venn diagrams. So all these are forms in which we can say that an argument is valid or methods with which we can find out whether arguments are valid. And valid generally means um, that the conclusion follows from the premises uh, in a correct way. But there are also more technical definitions of validity. And this is what we will do here now. We will try to understand what it means for an argument to be valid. Right. So in the last uh, sessions we talked about uh, conditional arguments necessary and sufficient conditions, types of necessity, and then we talked about categorical syllogisms, Venn diagrams. Um, so these are all things we talked about the, in the previous session. And now today we are talking about what validity is, how can we define an, uh, validity, and how can we can see whether an argument is valid. And then we will learn a formal method to show whether an argument is valid, and this formal method is called natural deduction. Um, it's a kind of proof in logic. It is not something that you really need for this particular class. And so we, in this class, um, you know, because it's taught by different people, it has been decided that natural deduction is not going to be one of the required parts of this class. But we can uh, still ask questions about natural deduction in our uh, optional parts because every every one of the instructors in this class can have some optional topics so we are allowed to, to teach you natural deduction and to ask you about it and uh, I particularly think that this might be a useful skill because if you want to prove that an argument is valid then the only other way you have to do it um, reliably is to make a truth table. And truth tables with complex expressions can be very long. And it can be very tedious to make a long truth table. And uh, proofs that something is valid are surely part of the exam, right? So this is one of the, of the standard bits in the exam is, you know, prove the validity of something. And uh, so if you have only truth tables to prove that an argument is valid, then this will take you a lot of time. If you have a better method, like natural deduction, then it will take you less time. It will work better for you, right? So this is why you should learn natural deduction, uh, even if you don't feel, you know, like you are um, um, a very mathematical person. Uh, I am also not, but, you know, you can understand this thing. It's not that difficult. And um, try to understand it, and it will be helpful because a few lines uh, of a formal proof in, uh, with this method uh, can save you. You can do them in a few minutes. It can save you making a truth table that might take you 15 minutes to make uh, and uh, is even more error-prone, right? You can make more mistakes in a truth table than you can um, in a natural deduction proof. So I think that it's worth learning, so you should really try to learn this stuff. But but again, don't panic. If you if you cannot learn it, uh, I'm not going to ask you specifically about natural deduction in the exam. I will ask you prove something, and uh, or we will ask you prove something, and then you can prove it however you like. You can prove it using natural deduction, or you can prove it using um, any other method, uh, for example, truth tables. Right. So you will always have the choice of how to prove something, but. Um, Natural deduction is often the more efficient way. Okay, so first let's see what validity is at all, right? What does it mean that an argument is valid? So, um, for example, I said that affirming the antecedent is valid while affirming the consequent is not valid. But what does this mean? Why is the one valid and the other not valid? And how do I know that? 
And now comes the definition, right? What does it mean for an argument to be valid? An argument is valid if the conclusion is always true when the premises of the argument are true. So this you have to remember, this you have to memorize. An argument is valid if the conclusion is always true when the premises of the argument are true. And this is, in other words, when true premises always lead to a true conclusion. So if an argument can have true premises and a false conclusion, then it is not valid. Okay? True premises must lead to a true conclusion. So is affirming the antecedent valid? How can I prove this? Imagine somebody told you, prove that affirming the antecedent is valid with a truth table. How would you do this? Think about it for a moment. Stop the video here. Think about it for a moment. How do you go about proving that when the premises are true in an affirming the antecedent argument, the conclusion must always be true? How do you, how do you show this? Okay. So what this means is affirming the antecedent valid. It means, is the conclusion always true when the premises are true? Right? This is what it means. We just said this is a definition of validity. So first you write it down formally, <clears throat> affirming the antecedent. You remember how to do that, right? Premise 1, P implies Q. Premise 2 is P. The conclusion is Q. This is what affirming the antecedent means. P implies Q, P therefore Q. If it rains, the street will be wet. It rains, therefore the street is wet. And now you see a little bit of, of uh, symbolism here. So first you can write premises and conclusion you don't, in one line. You don't need to write them uh, under each other. This is a different way of writing them that saves some space. You can omit these words, premise and conclusion also, and just write P implies Q, comma, P. And then comes the second bit, which is this character, this strange character that looks like a, a sideways T or something. Um, this is called a turnstile, and, and this is the character that says that uh, the conclusion follows from these premises. It is, it shows entailment. Uh, technically, in a moment I will tell you what entailment means. It means essentially the same thing. So, it means the conclusion follows from the premises. So, you have this little character, this uh, turnstile character, to show the conclusion. And so now I want to show this. Is the conclusion always true when the premises is true? And now I can make a truth table to show this, right? And this is what I do here. So I make a truth table that shows both the premises and the conclusion. I have P, Q, I have P implies Q. This is just a truth table for an implication, right? It's the same thing. This is the truth table of the implication. And it looks exactly like that. P, Q, P implies Q. If you just ignore the first line that says premise and conclusion, this is a normal implication truth table. It's only false when the first is true and the second is false. Right? It is true in every other case. So now, I have made my truth table, but now I want to see, is the conclusion always true when the premises are true? So now I have to read this, not as an implication truth table. I have to read it differently. I have to see what are the premises and what is the conclusion. And if I go back, you know, here, I can clearly see the premise 1 is P implies Q, the premise 2 is P, and the conclusion is Q. So I write these things on top of my truth table. And <clears throat> so I know that the two premises I want to look at are in the last column, right, and in the first column. And the middle column here is my conclusion. And so my question is, is the conclusion always true when the premises are true? And now you can look when are the premises true, both premises true. Both premises are true only in the first line. In the second line, the premise 2 is false. In the third line, the premise 1 is false. In the fourth line, the premise 2 is false again. So the only line where the both premises are true is the first line. And in the first line, when both premises are true, the conclusion actually is also true. And this is the thing, right? The conclusion is true whenever the premises are true. 
And this shows you that this argument is valid. If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. This is a valid argument. If there was at least one line where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then the argument would not be valid because then when the premises are true, the conclusion would not necessarily be true. But now here it is, right? So the argument here is valid because whenever the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. Now, let's do it ourselves. In the same way, prove that affirming the consequent is invalid using a truth table. Prove that affirming the consequent is invalid using a truth table. So, make a truth table like that and think first what affirming the consequent means and assign correctly your premises and your conclusion and then read the truth table in this way of premises and conclusion and see is the conclusion always true when the premises are true. Okay? It's essentially the same thing what we just did. You just have to assign the premises and conclusion differently. Okay? So take a break here. Stop the video, do this, and then we look at it together. Okay? So here it is. Uh, affirming the consequent, first you write it down. P implies Q. Q, therefore P. It's still an implication truth table, but now the meaning of premises and conclusion is different, right? The assignment is different. So, you still have the same truth table, P, Q, P implies Q, is still an implication truth table, still looks exactly the same like in the previous example, only now it has changed what the premises are and what the conclusion is. So now the right column is the premise 1, the middle column is the premise 2, and the conclusion is in the first column. And now you ask, are, is the conclusion always true when the premises are true? And you look in the first line, the premises are true, and the conclusion is true in the first line. This is good. Until now, it seems to be valid. But now you look at the second line, the premises are true again, but now in the second line, the conclusion is false. The third and fourth line are not interesting anymore uh, because we already have our answer, but also because the premises are not true, right? In the third line, both premises are false. In the fourth line, one premise is false. So anyway, these don't apply, right? The question is, when the premises are true, what happens with the conclusion? And now, even if the premises are true, I can have the possibility that the conclusion is false. This is what the second line shows. And therefore, I cannot say... If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, which was the definition of validity. Therefore, this is not valid. The premises can be true, but the conclusion can still be false. Right? This shows that affirming the consequent is not a valid argument form. So here we have these symbols again, so the turnstile. Uh, technically means sequent, meaning the expression on the right is supposed to follow from the expression on the left in a valid way, meaning when on the left I have true premises, then I must have a true conclusion on the right. But this could still be wrong, while if the symbol has two lines, like here in the second paragraph, it has two lines, like an equal sign, then it means that the expression on the right has been proven to follow from the expression on the left or is known to do so. So there, there is no doubt about it, while in the first case it is uh, unknown whether this is true and you still have to prove it, right? So this is the difference between the two. So when you say affirming the antecedent, which is something that everybody knows that is true, um, uh, that, that the conclusion follows from the premises, this is a valid argument, you would use the two lines, while when you want to prove something for yourself is an exercise you would use one line as long as you have not proven it and later if it is proven you can use two lines <clears throat> now <clears throat> this is called entailment is the relationship between the premises and the conclusion uh, when the argument is valid this means when the conclusion is true in the case that the premises are true this is called entailment so 
here's a little more um, technical way of saying it if you have one logical expression b conclusion and a set of logical expressions a1 to a n which are the premises then you can say that a1 to a n entail b if and only if there is no assignment of truth values under which a i to a n the premises are true and b the conclusion is false this is when it is impossible right it means when it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false this is exactly the definition of validity right so this is equivalent to saying that b follows logically from a i a a1 to a n um, or it is equivalent to saying that in a valid argument the premises entail the conclusion Okay, so this is just entail is just a word. It's it's nothing scary. It's just a word meaning that the conclusion follows logically from the premises. Uh, but because philosophers love this word entailment, uh, it might appear in books. It might appear in exams. So you need to know the word, right? It's it's nothing dangerous. It just says that the if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. So here is uh, an example of entailment. You have P, you have Q, and you have P or Q, and P entails P or Q, for example, we can say, because whenever P is true, P or Q will also be true. Right? In the, in the last two lines of this, P is true, and P or Q is also true. So you can say P entails P or Q. But P or Q does not entail P. Because there are cases where P or Q is true, but P is not necessarily true. So, for example, the second line. P or Q is true, but P is false. So, therefore, P or Q does not entail P. Okay? So, entail means if the premises are true, if the, if the, if the left thing of the entailment relation is true, then the right thing must also be true. Then the left thing entails the right thing. Okay. So remember this word entailment because this is often used in exams also to, um, to, to pose questions about whether conclusions follow from particular premises or arguments are valid. Sometimes the question is then asked in terms of entailment. Okay. So here we have a few valid argument patterns that we can use, which are known to be valid, which we will not prove now. You, you could prove all of those by, by making a truth table, for example, but we won't do that. Uh, we will just assume that they are true to save some time, right? We, we don't need, because we are not really doing natural deduction um, from the ground up is not what we're interested in. We are just interested in using the ideas behind natural deduction to prove something. So we just begin with a collection of, of random relations that are useful when you want to prove something. So affirming the antecedent, P implies Q, P, therefore Q. Denying the consequent, P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. This is also valid, right? We know this. Then the hypothetical syllogism is the following thing. A implies B, comma, B implies C, therefore A implies C. This is easy to understand, right? If A implies B and B implies C, then A also implies C. For example, if I get up late, I will miss the class. If I miss the class, I will get a bad grade. Conclusion, if I get up late, then I will get a bad grade. Right? If, the, if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. The next thing is the disjunctive syllogism. P or Q, second premise not P, conclusion Q. And you can do the same with Q. P or Q, second premise not Q, conclusion P. How does this work? If I assume that the premises are true, so I assume that P or Q is true in the first line, but then I know that not P is also true, meaning that P is false. Then what can I say about the Q? I must, it must be true that the Q is true. Why? Because P or Q is true, 
but p is assumed to be false but then how can p or q be true only if q is true right so the disjunctive syllogism disjunctive syllogism makes use um, of this uh, fact that the p or q if i want it to be true needs to have one of its two components true and if i know that one is false then necessarily the other must be true right and and this is symmetric i can um say not p or i can say not q and then i know that the other thing is true here i have a, an interesting argument called a dilemma it has three premises and one conclusion p implies q r implies s and now i know that p or r must be true and therefore i can conclude that q or s must be true this is common in real world argumentation something like if i go shopping i will spend a lot of money p plus q if i stay at home i will be bored i have to go shopping or stay at home therefore i will spend a lot of money or i will be bored right so you have two if then statements and then you have to select one of the two antecedents and as a conclusion you get one of the two consequences um this makes sense, right? It's not difficult. Then I have the conjunction in. The conjunction in says if I know that P is true and if I know that Q is true, then I also know that P and Q must be true. Right? If P is true and Q is true separately, then P and Q must also be true. And I can do this in the reverse also if this could then called conjunction out if i know that p and q is true then i know that p is true and separately i also know that q is true because otherwise p and q could not be true right finally the double negation p is equivalent and these are the three lines the three lines just means equivalent p is equivalent to not not p what does this mean p is equivalent to not not p it means that if i say this is a bottle then I, I can say this is a bottle then i can say this is this other thing is not a bottle but everything that is not a non-bottle is again a bottle everything that is not non-blue is blue when it is not not night then it is night and so on right so uh, whenever i negate something twice then i'm back at the thing i started with Right? Assuming you have two states, night and day, and now it's not night, then it is day. But if it's not not night, then it's night again, because it's not day. Right? So the double negation. And, and you can do this with as many negations as you want. You can say P is also equivalent to not, 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 not P. So any even number of nots can be deleted without any loss of uh, meaning without any any truth value change while an odd number of knots is equivalent to one knot okay and then we have de morgan's laws we we talked about those previously this is the thing about bring uh, come to the party but don't bring peter and mary don't bring peter or mary um, and this is also equivalent to um this is also the thing about the fish, uh, the soup with uh, chicken meat or fish balls, right? We had multiple examples of this thing um, that went like that. Okay, so these are the De Morgan laws. Uh, remember this. Now, we are, we are coming to an end with two left. Uh, there are 11 uh, uh, rules here. This is the, but they are all easy, right? They're easy to understand. So this one is called contraposition. 
contraposition uh, is essentially the same thing as denying the consequent, is the same idea behind it, only now it is uh, written as an equivalent, uh, while denying the consequent is written as an argument with premise as a conclusion, but is the same thing. So you say P implies Q, and this is equivalent to not Q implies not P. Okay? If P then Q is equivalent to not Q, therefore not P. If it rains, the street will be wet, is equivalent to saying if the street is not wet, then it has not rained. Okay? So, finally we have, this is the only one perhaps that needs a little more thought, along with the De Morgan's laws, but these we have already explained, uh, the conditional disjunction exchange. So P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q. P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q. This makes intuitive sense if you think about it, but it's a little difficult to think about. Take an example. If it rains, then the street will be wet is equivalent to it has not rained or the street is wet. Because otherwise, if it had rained, the street would be wet. Right? So you can easily see that the two are equivalent using a truth table if you want to make a truth table and show that they're equivalent. So this is an interesting way of getting rid of an implication. If you have an implication somewhere, and for a proof you want to get rid of the implication, then you use this and transform the implication into a disjunction, into an or. Right? Or in the same way you can make an or into an implication backwards. Right? These two are equivalent. Okay. So now here is a table that summarizes all of those. And it would be useful if you learned those, because these are relations that you will need over and over again when you try to prove something in logic. You will always do it like that. You will um, take what the exercise gives you and you will transform it using these uh, equivalences and, and argument patterns in order to arrive at what you have to prove. And these are the most common and with these you can prove most things. right? So try to do that. Um, and now we come to this method of natural deduction. How does this work? How do I do natural deduction? When we want to show the validity of statements by deriving the conclusion from the premises, this is called natural deduction because it follows the way we reason naturally. Let's try to do this. Reason naturally is, of course, I mean, this is something philosophers say, it, it will probably not seem very natural to you. But um, you get used to it and then it becomes more natural. Okay? So, if coffee was healthier than tea, then all people would be drinking coffee. Assume this is true. This is a premise. If all people were drinking coffee, then coffee would be expensive. Another premise. Coffee is not expensive, therefore coffee is not healthier than tea. So is this now valid or is it not valid? And this this could be an examination question. Now you don't have to do anything cra any crazy proofs for this. You can just make a truth table. Write it down formally and then make a truth table and show that when the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. But you can do it more easily. So let's first write it down. C implies D. If coffee was healthier than tea, then all people would drink coffee. Second premise. If all people drank coffee, then coffee would be expensive. D implies E. Third premise. Coffee is not expensive. Therefore, conclusion, coffee is not healthier than tea. How can I prove this using these equivalences we just said before? If you want, stop here for a moment, go back, look at these equivalences we just had, and try to do it yourself. So what you could do, um, one way would be to say from C implies D and D implies E follows that C implies E. This is the hypothetical syllogism, you remember? And we know that not E from premise 3 and therefore we know that not C because this is denying the consequent. Right? If I have C implies E and I know that not E, then I can know that also not C. 
This is an easy way to show it. There's another way. I can also say from not E and premise 2 we know that not D, denying consequent. And from not D and 1 we know that not C, denying consequent. So I can do two times denying consequent or I can do a hypothetical syllogism and one denying consequent. It's the same thing. So many of these proofs have various ways how you can do them. Right? There's not one right way to do it. And now the last thing with natural deduction is that there's a particular way of writing it so that everybody can read it. People have just agreed there's one particular way of writing these things so that it is easy to read them. And this is the way of writing them. When you remove an and um, with conjunction out, right, then you write and o, so the, the thing that you remove comes first, and then the o means out, so conjunction out, and out. The conjunction in is and in. The or is the disjunction, disjunction in, v, in. Affirming the antecedent, you write it as mp. Denying the consequent, you write it as mt. These names for affirming the antecedent and denying the consequent are names that we have already talked about. Um, the hypothetical syllogism, you write it as hs. The destructive syllogism, ds, right? These are just abbreviations. Double negation, dn, de Morgan's laws, dem, and contraposition con. So th there is no. Uh, uh, it's not necessary to remember these things. I'm not going to give you a bad grade if you don't uh, remember these abbreviations, but they make it just easier to, to write it down and to communicate what you are doing if you have a short way of writing these things down. Okay? So now, let's write this thing uh, down again in the formalism of natural deduction. And uh, how you do it is always the same way. Each line is, has a number. In the first column, you write the result that you want to achieve in this line. And then in the second column, you write the numbers of the line you use to derive the conclusion, plus the short form of the name of the rule you use. So this becomes more clear if we see it in an example and repeat until the left column contains the desired conclusion. Okay? We, we look at an example in a moment. So here it is. This is the thing with the coffee. Okay? C implies D, D implies E, not E, therefore not C. And in the first line we write what we want to prove. So what you want to prove is not C and well, your premises are on the left side. So the first thing I do is to say I have not E, which is a premise. So I say line 1 not E, premise. Line 2, D implies E, is also a premise. Line 3, not D. This is my conclusion, not D. And why can I know that not D? Because of line 1 and line 2 with the modus tollens, which is the Latin name, the abbreviation for denying the consequent. And then I have C implies D, premise again. And from, from 3 and 4, last line, from 3 and 4, again with denying the consequent, I can derive not C. Okay? That's it. And so this, this way of writing it is what is called natural deduction. Well, it's just this way of writing things down. And this makes it easy for people to understand your proof, to, to read it and to understand it. Um, you don't need to explain anything. You can show this table to anyone and everybody will know what you are doing there. Okay? So now, show that this is valid and try to write it down in the formalism of natural deduction. P and Q implies R, Q implies P, Q therefore R. If you think a little, <coughs> you would see that it's very easy, right? If you, if you think about it first... <coughs> And then write it down. Normally, you shouldn't start writing down the natural deduction immediately because it's a little difficult to, to make sense of it. You should first think of it and you should try to um, get an idea of what you're supposed to do and how you will do it and perhaps take some informal notes on a piece of paper and then reconstruct your natural deduction. Okay, do it now and come back when you are done.
So now the informal notes we do first, right? Like I said, P and Q implies R <coughs> is a premise. Q implies P, <coughs> another premise. <coughs> Q is another premise. <coughs> From Q implies P and Q follows that P, affirming the antecedent. From P and Q follows that P and Q, conjunction in. From P and Q and the first premise, P and Q implies R, follows that R, affirming the antecedent. And R is what I wanted, right? So I'm finished. I've proven it. Look at this. Make sure that you understand this, how this works. And now it's, it's easy, right? Uh, and now if you have done this successfully, then please... Uh, write it down in the formalism of natural deduction and then it would look like this, right? You write on top what you want to prove and then you write one by one the lines. So P and Q implies R is a premise, Q implies P is a premise, Q is a premise. P follows from 2, line 2 and line 3. So these numbers on the right side there are the lines, right? In line 4, P. Then it says 2, 3, comma MP. Means from line 2 and line 3 with MP, which is the affirming the antecedent, right? Follows P. Then I have P and Q. This follows from 4 and 3 with um, conjunction in. And then I have R, which follows from 5 and 1, again with affirming the antecedent. And R is what I want to prove, so now I'm finished. The thing with, with this way of writing it is that you should not have any gaps, right? You should not uh, jump. It's Every step must be explicitly written down and every step must follow from some previous step. So this requires a little um, exercising and a little um, care to not omit any steps, to not jump and say, oh, this is clear. Nothing is supposed to be clear, right? Everything has to be proven step by step in this system. So here we have some more exercises. Um, show the validity of this. Uh, P or not Q or R. R implies not S. S and Q. And from this you conclude P. Now think about it again for a while and then come back for the answer. Now again, the informal notes first, before you start writing it down, you can see that from S and Q follows S and Q, I can do the conjunction out, right? S is equivalent to not not S by double negation. From not not S and the premise R implies S follows not R by denying the consequent because not not S is the opposite of not S. From not R, which I just got from step three, and the premise P or Q or not R follows P or not Q. This is the disjunctive syllogism because if I know that P or not Q or R and I know that R is false, then P or not Q must be true. Q is equivalent to not not Q by double negation and from not not Q and P or Q follows P, which is the desired conclusion. And again, I can write it down. Now, this gives me a 10-step, you know, looks very impressive, but it's actually, it's very easy. It's what we just did. Um, you just write it down one by one uh, without omitting anything. Just make sure that every step can be derived from the things you write on the right side. Again, the abbreviations, you don't need necessarily all these abbreviations. It, it is not a mistake, you know, if you have forgotten destructive syllogism to that it is DS, you can just write destructive syllogism, I don't care, or double negation, right? You don't need to write DN. But you need to know the names of these things, right? Or, or MT, you can write, you know, denying consequent instead of MT. Um, but... You should know the name of the of the actual rules. I mean, these you need to know so that I know why you think that you can derive these conclusions, right? Okay, so today we talked about validity in propositional logic and natural deduction. I hope that this made some sense. 
go back. Don't don't be you know afraid um, if it was difficult. It, it is difficult. Uh, there is also this open course where here from uh, HKU. So you can think there. You can go there. I'm sorry, uh, modules uh, Q4 and Q5. Uh, also talk about natural deduction. They make it a little more difficult than I did. So we ours is very superficial, right? It's just the first look at it. Um, they have a more systematic approach where they teach you all the basic operations uh, that you have to know in order to derive more complex things later. Uh, this is more than what we need, right? So if you can understand uh, what I'm saying here, then stick with that and don't uh, necessarily go there because you will be confused probably uh, and learn too much. But on the other hand, if you like mathematics, if you like proofs and if you can do it, then go do it. Um, and then this year will be uh, even much easier for you if you can do the little more challenging things that they do over there. Okay. So, um, but again, I know that this is, is challenging, especially if you are not into mathematics. It might look a little scary. So then go over this multiple times. Uh, go back to all these exercises. Go step for step until you really understand every single step. And then you will be okay. Okay. So... Um, thank you. If you have questions, again, write me an email or uh, come to the tutorial. Okay, thank you.